Welcome to Dollar Theater. This is the podcast where we talk about movies that we love, some of which are critically acclaimed, some not so much. I don't think there's any dispute about the acclaim for the movie we're covering tonight. This might be arguably the best comedy of this century. We're definitely going to discuss it. And for that, I've got two of my good friends here. I've got returning for the first time since we've covered Neighbors a few months ago, Brigitte Wagner. And first time guest, Chris Aragon. Hi. What is up, guys? Hey, guys. Hello. Hi. I'm excited to be on the podcast. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm, I'm really pumped. Really pumped. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I'm excited to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right. Super bad. 2007. I think this might be the most that I've ever laughed in a theater. I saw this opening weekend and like my sides hurt, literally. I know people say that hyperbolically, but I, I was literally like my stomach was in pain after seeing this movie. That's how much I laughed. I don't think I've laughed so much at a movie in the theaters before I see, saw this. I think American Pie maybe was right. the most I've laughed in a theater. And Coincidentally, there's a lot of similarities between that movie and this movie that we're covering tonight. I think the key factor that kind of separates these two, though, is Judd Apatow. If you watch a lot of his movies like Knocked Up, Bridesmaids, or even like recently, The King of Staten Island, there's he's really focused on having a good story and having the characters care about each other. And I think that's we see a lot of that from Seth, Evan, Fogel, Jules, even the cops, uh, Slaters and Michaels. We see a lot of these characters genuinely care for each other. So while those two movies, the, the, the core of those is a bunch of horny teenagers trying to have sex. There's also like this has a great story and a, an emphasis on friendship that I don't think that one has as much. All right, so combine that with the fact that you have a bunch of comic icons in this movie kind of just starting off their career. You have Jonah Hill, Michael Sarah, Emma Stone, Seth Rogen, Bill Hader. I could keep going, but you get it. And all these people were just about to pop off. Uh, this just makes this movie with the story and the one liners. It's one of the best comedies of all time. So I'm really glad to be talking about it with both of you. I love this movie. Bridget, why do you? Oh, yeah. So um, when you said American Pie, I think, you know, you kind of hit the spot there that I, that, that when I rewatched it, that's kind of the first thing that came to my mind was, you know, I see how this is in the same vein of American Pie. But, you know, it was kind of like the new era of that. And like I agree to Judd Apatow, he kind of brings his own new tone, you know, with his style of humor. And this was kind of one of his earlier works besides, you know, like Freaks and Geeks. And, you know, I think he had a few movies maybe before this. But, you know, this is like really setting that Judd Apatow tone, I think, that many of us come, you know, we really came to love in his other further movies. Definitely. Uh, Chris, what works about this movie for you? So, wow. So kind of just thinking about, you know, when I first saw this movie, I was a freshman in high school. Wow. That's just crazy to think. But I remember seeing this movie everywhere it was unavoidable everyone was talking about it and i thought that this was one of the funniest movies i had seen at that time and i rewatched it this weekend and i was just like oh my god this is so funny and it's like crazy to think too about you know like how like you said dave like a lot of these people were up and coming because watching this movie what was like it's crazy to think how it had of its time this movie was when it comes to the talent. I mean, like, and just thinking of where all these people are now, like, for example, like Emma Stone is an Oscar winner. And to this day, I really yes. think she's the only American mm -hmm. actress who can actually pull off a British accent. I feel like <laughs> British people, British actors can do an American accent, but it's very hard for American actors to do British accents. But I think that Emma Stone is one of the few people few American actresses who can pull off a British accent while well, she was in The Favourite, she was in Cruella, very good British accents there. We have Jonah Hill, who's just gone on to do multiple things. And, you know, like, it's crazy because I feel like in a way he's kind of become like a street, like a streetwear style icon in a sense, because I feel like I've gotten so used to seeing his, like, you know, his, his fashion style. I feel like 
he's become more known for like his fashion style and whatnot and how he dresses, you know, he's lost all the way and like yeah. he's found ways to express himself differently. So I think like that's dope. And also he directed that mid nineties movie a few years ago, which I actually loved. And I think it's, uh, it's slept on it. It's crazy to think that Alexa Demi from Euphoria was like in that. <laughs> and I feel like that movie really kind of captured like nineties skater, zeitgeist really well and then also like michael Sarah, i think like the crazy thing is like i feel like it was a two and two for two for him this year that year 2007 because years because months later juno came out and i thought that that, that was one of my favorite comedies so but 2007 was just a solid movie year like i remember i was obsessed with that i was obsessed with juno and then of course there was there will be blood there was no country for old men very good oscar big year um, oscar uh oscar content that year for sure as well certainly so chris you kind of touched on it a little bit but let's talk about jonah hill who is arguably the star of this movie one one a with sarah there um if you followed him early in his career, you see some of the things he was in. He was it was in a lot of these Judd Apatow produced or directed movies. Yeah, he was in the Forty Year Old Virgin, Knocked Up, uh, Grandma's Boy. So if you looked at him early, you might have thought that he was about to have like a Chris Farley type of career, just as like right, like, just a big comic guy, huge presence, and that would have been fine. He would have been really good at that. But he kind of he went off on his own path a little bit. He did do com- go back to comedy with the 21 jump street series, which was we've covered 21 jump street in the past and Love it. He, really good at all those. Um, but he would get o- nominated for two Oscars. Chris, I think you alluded to this earlier, uh, Moneyball and Wolf of wall street. So he's working with like these big name directors. Right. Um, Chris, you mentioned mid nineties, which I also, I loved just, he directed that. You talked about his fashion line. So he, could have been someone just stayed in this Apatow world of comedies, mm-hmm. but he branched out, did a lot of other great things. He's so funny in this movie. I think this is this is the movie that really kind of put him on the map. But he's very like an interesting career for him. I, I love anything he's in. Sign me up for it. I also thought about the Maniac, the show on Netflix that he All was right, on, where yeah. he, right. he re- reunited with Emma Stone. Yeah, so just in a plethora of different kinds of things Bridget, what do you think about him in either in this movie or in general absolutely agree with both of you i mean uh what a versatile actor that he is and we couldn't have seen it back then you know and it would have been perfectly fine if he did apatow after apatow film you know he's hilarious but um you know he's got a very artistic side to him too and it would be interesting to see where his director side goes well in the future i think that there could be more coming out of him in the future you know on that side too Right. Chris, I know you touched on it uh Hill a little bit, but any any additional thoughts on him? Yeah, so I it the funny thing like it's crazy because when I was watching this it also made me think he I remember seeing him first in this movie called Accepted which was which came out Just the long. year prior and that oh, one that. was was pretty good. I remember he was in that and then it's just like it's just crazy to me like yeah, like how far he's come because the crazy like thing for me at least you know was rewatching this movie and thinking wow there's kind of like lots of seeds planted in this movie for future stuff like for example i noticed dave franco made a cameo no! and then also i know there was a line where he said oh this has been effed up since jump street and then they oh my would God. Both be in 21 Jump Street <laughs> yep. like later. And like, yeah, I, I mean, actually I missed loved, that. That's hilarious. Yeah, I loved both 21 and 22 Jump Street. Like yes. now thinking about it, like, hey, you know what? If Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum want to make a third one to kind of like um to kind of capitalize off like, you know, nostalgia, I'm all for it. And I mean, also Channing Tatum kind of has had a comeback this year. He had The Lost City and Dog, even though I haven't watched them both, but I've been wanting to. But, you know, like, he's kind of having a resurgence in some ways, too. So, hey, let's go for it. But also, I just remembered, too, like, it's crazy how he's gone to different things. I completely just remembered that Jonah Hill was also in Don't Look Up. (laughs) Yep, yep. Oh, my God, that's so true, yeah. Another Oscar-nominated film, yeah. Yeah, and also, wasn't he... Okay, I've 
The Big Short has been one of my blind spots, and I've been meaning to watch that. But was he in The Big Short as well? He was not. Okay. I think everybody but him was in that movie. <laughs> gotcha. I think people just keep getting it mixed up with like Wolf of Wall Street or Money. Yeah, Ball, probably in the same vein. It seems like. All right, so we started to talk about uh, Michael Sarah a little bit. Before seeing this, I think the first thing I recognized him from was as George Michael in yes. Arrested Development Arrested as Development. Jason Bateman's son. And, you know, basic, almost playing like a variant of that character in this movie. He, he's an actor who kind of has like one note a little bit, but it's, it's a really yeah. good note. Yeah. And so, Chris, you mentioned earlier, this same year, he banged out this and Juno, which I... Adore Juno, such such a good movie there. Yeah, and a couple years later, he'd make Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, which is another one we've covered on this show. Yeah, and for whatever reason, he didn't really have the same career that Jonah Hill had. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I don't know him personally, so I can't ask him why that is. But (laughs) I do get the sense from talking, from hearing him in interviews, that he maybe wasn't necessarily interested in being like a mega movie star it just right. seems like he kind of wants to be low-key but he still pops up in things right I mean, he was a, a poker player in molly's game uh i did not watch that show life with beth on hulu with amy schumer it was really good i saw it yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I heard it's great things about it same kind of role again though you know it's <laughs> it's the michael Sarah character yeah. again yeah. but he was you know, good you know yeah. he did his thing I know he was in the Twin Peaks movie too, which I, I didn't say, but I didn't see that. He but was he... in Twin Peaks. I just I just watched that five years later yeah. because you know, I think with the pandemic, everyone was like trying to play catch up with TV and whatnot. So for me, I did that with Game of Thrones, and then I also did that with Twin Peaks. I'm finally caught up. I started my t- original Twin Peaks binge last year, and I was like, I know I want to get to to the new season but the the first few couple seasons of Twin Peaks are so wild and crazy that you just kind of have to let them digest for a little bit before you move on to like the next thing which was the return the modern day sequel and it's just it's just next level but it's just David Lynch being David his mo- <laughs> like it's David Lynch being David Lynch and there's no like constraint which is like insane but incredible to watch but yeah I, it was so crazy to see him in that but you know what else like I randomly thought I thought of this while watching this but they kind of had a reunion in Sausage Party he was like the little yeah. wiener and okay, yeah, I was like the big wiener and I honestly love that movie but I do think it's divisive because I think some people are like it's like stupid but like I have the humor of a middle eight of a of a middle schooler (laughs) so I find it hilarious (laughs) oh yeah so Sarah has been in like a ton of just like Hill not as big of a career but he's been in a lot of diverse types of shows and movies yeah Bridget you have any any thoughts on him and this or his career um, I think when he did Scott Pilgrim is where I really took notice of him. Sure. And I, I feel like his career, like, I think more people just in general knew who he was at that point, because that was, you know, where it really became more the focus on him. He's the main character. Um, yeah, I, I, I think maybe he's just not as, I don't know, his path is a little different with Jonah Hills. You know, maybe he didn't have that, like, Hollywood drive. Like, he's Canadian, you know, I, don't, I have Canadian blood. I know how Canadians do, you know, he's, he's just different. He's a little quirky. You know, he's happy to do the projects that make him happy, I think. And, you know, we love him for it. So it works. Yeah. All right. So we talked about those two. 15 years after this movie came out, you can make a solid argument that the biggest star to come out of it was Emma Stone as yeah. Jules. Um, won an Oscar for La La Land, twice nominated for both uh, Birdman and The Favorite. So has her own Cruella was awesome. She has another Cruella movie coming out. So she's arguably one of the biggest stars in the world right now. And this was her film debut. And you just threw her in the ring with these, like, my goodness, not not veterans of comedy, but people who have been around the block a, a few times before this. And she did not look out of place at all. She hung right with these guys all through it. And, like the uh, the two actors we mentioned previously, she's been in a lot of different types of movies too. She went back to comedy several times. Zombieland and Easy A were some that I thought of right away. Um, and then she's done some period piece dramas like The Help and Battle of the Sexes. So just another one 
multiple time Oscar nominee, Oscar winner. And I easily, if you, if you had told me in 2007, as I'm sitting in the theater, this is going to be one of the biggest stars in the world upon seeing her, I wouldn't have yeah. been surprised at that at all. So I thought she was she's, great in this movie. She's great strong though. Like yeah, I didn't guy, realize how strong she was back then as an actress though. Right. Cause she has a lot of the same mannerisms, like, like her pacing, like, just in general, her acting style, I feel like, you know, was strong from the get go and it stayed strong or it maybe even has gotten stronger. But, you know, I was like, she kind of looks like a miniature version of the self we, you know, know her as today. Uh huh. Absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah. Uh, Chris, any Emma Stone thoughts? Yeah. So, like, talking about like the titans of like comedy at that time. But yeah, she held her own. And I just love like, because now thinking about it, like, she does comedy so well. And then she also has this other side to her where, she, you know, she is a more dramatic actress. And I now thinking about it, I feel as if the reason she won for La La Land is it was kind of like a mixture. It was like a perfect fusion of both worlds, like her dramatic side as well as her comedic side. And it's like interesting, too, because I think like. I don't blame her for doing this, but I feel as if after La La Land, it seemed as if she became maybe more selective with the roles that she does pick. Because I remember, you know, have, seeing her on the upswing, you know, with like this, Easy A, and she was in Zombieland, and then she was in Crazy Stupid Love, and then she... I think she also did another movie, I remember, called Gangster Squad, which I didn't watch. I just heard it wasn't that great. It was, and then, it was fine. Yeah, she was slowly on the up. She was, and then Birdman, like, I think Birdman is when she started really being more serious. And then when she won for La La Land, I feel like I've only seen her in The Favorite and Cruella. Both were amazing. And I know she's, I believe she's teaming up again with Yorgos Lanthimos again with another movie. So I'm like, like excited and I don't blame her for being more selective you know especially if she's gotten to the point where she won an Oscar you know she can do what she wants and be more careful with her projects so it's just it's really cool to see that uh, trajectory and I do want to mention uh, too we haven't I don't think we've talked about Bill Hader yet like he's in this and it's like crazy to think because it makes me think like honestly like SNL like I still watch it just because I got so used to watching it but I really feel like the last time there were strong people was that era with him Fred Armisen yeah. Jason Sudeikis Kristen Wiig I feel like that was really the last strong SNL era I mean there's a few people that I think that I like now like I like Bowen Yang and I think Cicely um, Strong is funny but like I feel like that was the really last strong era of SNL people. <laughs> so you mentioned the uh, Lanthimos film that's called Poor Things and it's ex expected early 2023 also mm -hmm. co-starring Willem Dafoe, Mark Ruffalo, Margaret Qualley, Jared Carmichael. So this is a pretty stacked cast. I'm, yeah. I'm definitely going to be there. Yeah, and it has week. the guy from Raimi, I think is what it's called, on Hulu, I think. Yeah, yeah, Somehow. Rami. I don't know if it's Raimi or Rami. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yusef. That was yeah. a pandemic binge, that yeah. show. It was really good. <laughs> yeah, but I only watched like one episode and just haven't gotten to it, but I liked what I saw. All right, so we're going to get to Hater, but before we do, Let's round out our corner. I have this as our big four here. I, I, Seth, Evan, Jules, and the last actor we're going to talk about, Fogel, Christopher Mintz Plass. Um, he was also making his film debut. And I thought he was hilarious in this. And then I read like a lot of the lines that he said in this movie were improvised. Like, you know, when he, when he says things like, it's not so much the going with the ladies that's a problem, <laughs> but the coming. Yeah. Like, just things like that. <laughs> I don't see those being written on a script. It just seemed like they were right. You know, he's doing a lot of his scenes with Seth Rogen and Bill Hader. And these guys are just kind of like cooking at this point. It, it seems that that's the vibe I got from it. Um, so there are a ton, ton of funny one-liners from him in this that we're definitely going to go over. when we talk about scenes, I don't know if this is a gift or a curse. I would imagine if you talk to most actors, they would love to be typecast. They're so good in a role that they're that role forever. But I think this, this guy is just forever McLovin because of this role. I've yeah, seen he's no. been he's been in a lot of other things. Bridget, you were on with us when we covered Neighbors, and he was in that. And you know, I'm like, I make a DiCaprio meme reference in every show. It's not intentional, but I was literally like <laughs> DiCaprio pointing. I'm like McLovin, right? Every time you see him, I know. And he was in 
He was in uh, Kick-Ass. He was the villain. He was in Promising Young Woman as a guy making some bad decisions. And I'm like, fucking McLovin, what, what, what are we doing? <laughs> so, yeah. but I thought he was really good in this. And I, anytime I see him pop up, I, th- I think he's really funny. I don't know if you went up to 10 people and showed them his picture and you said, who is this? I, I would imagine <laughs> seven or eight of them would say that's McLovin as opposed to Christopher Vince Floss, which is, you know, good or bad. I don't know how he feels about that. He might take it as a compliment that he was so good in this role that he's probably McLovin forever. Bridget, what'd you think of him in this or anything about him? Oh yeah. He brought so much humor to this movie and he's just so young. Like what he's like 17 or 18 when he yep. was doing this. Um, I don't know if it's true or not. I read somewhere that his mom had to be on set too. That's, he's that's so some my internet research. Yep. <laughs> I was like, imagine like with the sex scenes and stuff, having your mother there. But like, <laughs> they must have been all about it though. Like, you know, supporting her son's career, you know. And <laughs> hopefully, this was 2007, so iPhones weren't that prominent yet. Hopefully, she had a book or something. Oh my. God. Yeah, something to keep mom busy because <laughs> <laughs> and she had it. I don't know. But um, yeah, j- he just brought so much fun, so much humor, and you know, it's yeah, it's he's just, just McLovin. He is who he is. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, any thoughts on him? I do think he's McLovin, although like it's crazy. I completely forgot he was in Kick Ass. I can't believe I forgot. Yeah, forgot about I forgot that. too until I looked at IMDb today, and I was like, oh yeah. I yeah. think his name was the motherfucker. Yeah. Was, oh my god. Name, right? <laughs> my yeah, god. that's right. Yeah, it's crazy because I because re- now like it makes sense he was in that. I didn't realize he was in Neighbors as well. But I will say, like speaking of Neighbors, I do like want to add like that. It's cr- it was crazy how this was when Seth Rogen was on the upswing too because he had Knocked yeah. Up, which was great. He had this, and like ever since then. I mean, he's pretty consistent. I think. Um, I really. I do like the first neighbors. I feel like the first neighbors is actually an underrated great movie. Great movie. I liked This Is the End. I loved Sausage Party. I didn't like the interview that much. That was one of his few misses with it's me. A blind spot. And, what? That's a blind spot of mine, the interview. Yeah. Oh gosh. And it's crazy because I realized like, oh, Pineapple Express too. That was great. Wow. Yeah. It's just Gem. crazy to think like it's kind of, like this was like one of the earlier you know um like collaborations between so many like of these actors as well um wow i kind of deviated a little bit but with christopher mintz plaz like i come like it was crazy to see him in promising young woman and i was just like <laughs> oh my god like yeah. but i mean the casting in that movie was just brilliant from top yes, to bottom yes i love that movie me it was too. like they had him and uh, Adam Brody, aka Seth Cohen from the OC. Yeah, it was just these guys making these. I don't think that was by coincidence. It was by design to have these figures mm-hmm. that we kind of worship now making bad decisions. True. It's like McLovin and Seth Cohen. Like, what are you guys fucking doing? Right. right. And, <laughs> yeah, and Schmidt from New Girl, and then yep. also right. seeing Jennifer Coolidge as the mom. Like that was just the best comic <laughs> relief but i i just i just love jennifer coolidge though and yes. like the crazy thing yeah. about her is i was reading like about how when she was in college she wanted to be a dramatic actress but now she's known as very much a character actress but i think she's brilliant for how she capitalizes off that and she knows that that's her shtick and that's what people love her for absolutely yeah she's great and great in the white lotus just oh, you know, oh my god girl. yes, yeah. yes I love it. totally all right so now we're gonna get to the, the two cops i know chris you mentioned hater and, and rogan a couple of times i have them kind of grouped together in this right so, this script was written by Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. Mm-hmm. They started writing this when they were 13 years old. Mm-hmm. And the plan was originally for Seth Rogen to play the role of Seth. That's why the characters' names are Seth and Evan, because it's, na- it's named after the two of them. But by the time this movie was greenlit to be made, mm-hmm. Seth Rogen was too old to be playing a high school kid. So mm-hmm. they wound up casting Jonah Hill. They had him read for it on the set of Knocked Up and he he got the role so that's how jonah hill got involved in this movie and then seth rogan wound up taking the role of officer michaels opposite bill Hader as as slater and these guys are just so funny in this like we, we talked about earlier with christopher Min's class and his lines it also feels like most of these guys are just like shooting from the hip in this i, I think of the one when seth when mclovin asks 
Officer Michael Seth Rogen, uh, what it's like to have a gun. And he says it's like having two cocks if, if one of your cocks could kill someone. <laughs> <laughs> and then I love in the bar where Bill Hader is talking about his, his first wife and how their marriage. And he's like, yeah, there was group sex. I wasn't involved, though. I, I just I just heard it. And you hear Michael's. He says, I wasn't involved. But Michael's like, I was just just in the background. <laughs> These guys are just so so funny in this role. I I love them. They're kind of like the pulse of this movie. And you know, at the end they they light their car their cop car on fire with McLovin and they shoot at it. I would imagine if you had like a post credit scene that was like 3 months later, it would these guys would not be on the force anymore. And there's definitely a world where I could see Officer Slater just being Barry, just shunned shunned from everything as uh because these these guys were just not qualified to be cops at all, and that was I think that that was the joke. It was it was really funny. So, Bridget, what did you think of them? Hilarious. Both of them are hilarious. I love them both now. I love them both then. Um, yeah, and I think part of it too was kind of like okay, you have these teenagers that are afraid of growing up. They're about to graduate, go to college, and then you have the cops that are also kind of like you know not ready to be adults yet, right? Like <laughs> they're also not ready to grow up, and yeah. so. It's like their own version of it. And it's just hilarious the way it ensues. Definitely. Chris? I I love that both of them ha- really gave some heart and warmth to the movie because they yeah. feel as if, you know, the whole movie is just Michael, Sarah, and Jonah Hill, our two leads, just butting heads. And then you have these two, like, cops that... It's so crazy because it had been maybe... It'd been years since I last saw it, so I just rewatched it this weekend, and I forgot about how, you know, these cops were, like, you know, the good guys at the end, and it's, like, it, it, I don't, it hit a soft spot with me in a way, because I feel like, you know, they're, it seems like, you know, they were just in their shoes, and they just, like, want to take yeah. care of them and whatnot, yeah. and I don't know if it's just me, but, like, I, I just turned 30, and so, like, I, when I, like, have, like, when I make gen z friends you know or like i'm just kind of like oh my god i want to take care of you like maybe that's right. just the nurturing side of you but it's like, like a I mentor was, i was in your spot once like just enjoy it <laughs> while you can like i like i'm i was just there like i want you to make sure like, you're all, you're all right so it you know it hits a soft spot because i think like when you're like when you're at that i feel like once you're like late twenties, early thirties, or even just thirties, you're at that interesting stage where you're still very much like you're still you're still very much young, but you've had more experience than some other people who are younger, and you just want to make sure like they don't like mess up or whatever. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> yeah, and this kind of goes with the theme we talked about in the top. Judd Apatow making his characters, even though he produced this movie, Greg Matola directed it, but these characters really care about each other. Except like and Evan really care about each other. Slater's Slater and Michael's really care about McLovin. They have really taken an interest in this guy and are kind of like trying to mentor him, as you said, Chris, and you, you can tell that these characters genuinely have affection for one another. So in addition to those, we have a bunch of side characters in this movie. There's just a lot of people who show up for like a scene or two and are really funny. Um, upon rewatching this, I have a, a new fondness for Joe, Joe Latrulio who played Francis, uh, the guy who hit Seth with his car. And he just, he's like, it just, his lines, I have like, I have them all written down. We'll definitely talk about them later. But he's like, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I have a warrant out for a totally non-violent crime. Yeah. Mercy Street, guys. <laughs> he's like, are you guys on MySpace? Like, <laughs> Where was he? Because when I saw watched it, I was like, who is this guy? Why does he look yep. so familiar? He looks familiar. He's He's a that guy. I know he was. I don't watch Brooklyn Nine Nine, but I know he was one of the. Oh, uh, I probably on that. I've seen him in. Yeah, I've seen a few episodes enough yeah. to recognize him. So, in addition to him, uh, Martha Mathi- Martha McIsaac plays Becca, uh, Evan's love interest in this. I thought she was really good. Yeah. Um, Eric Vatina Phillips, who plays Mindy, the liquor store clerk, who just poor woman just wants to get to her veterinary <laughs> exam and. Has to- <laughs> As deal with all this, um, David Crumholtz is one of the cokeheads in the party. I and, think who, I recognized him. Yeah, David Crumholtz. He's. I'm trying to remember. He 
I don't know why I'm getting him mixed up with Nick Kroll, but I think it's because David Krumholtz was in Sausage Party. Okay, well. I think everyone was in Sausage Party, it sounds like. Yeah, it feels like everyone was. But where is David Krumholtz from? I'm trying so to... He, so I'm a sucker for these things when they bring in somebody from a previous generation of teen movies to have a, a small part in this. He was one of the leads in 10 Things I Hate About You. He's been in a, a lot of other things, but 10 Things I Hate About You, his role is like Joseph Gordon-Levitt's kind of like right hand is kind of the thing that stands out for me. And when I saw when I saw him in this, that these callbacks, I'm put a callback in your movie and I'm going to shout it out because I'm a sucker for all that stuff. Nice. Um, so there are a lot of people that are just come in for like a scene or two. They're really good. Bridget, did anyone stand out for you? Not from the main cast that either that I mentioned or that I didn't mention. Um, yeah, the, I forget what his name was. You just said who hit Jonah Hill with a car. Um, uh, Joe Latrulio. Yeah. Right. And now that you said Brooklyn nine, 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 it's like, duh. Yeah. That's where he's from. Um, I thought he was really funny too. You know, it's just like came out of nowhere. And it's like, I recognize different faces. Um, like, um, Chris said with, uh, Franco, Dave Franco. Yep. It would have been nice to see a little bit more of him too. I guess his career didn't really grow as much maybe till later on. I don't, yep. I don't remember seeing him as often, but, um, nice to see both of them there too, though. Yeah. He's he, Greg in this movie and you, Greg, why don't you go piss your pants again? It's like, it was like <laughs> eight years ago. <laughs> uh, Chris, how about you? Anybody from the side cast stand out for you? Yeah, it's so funny. Like, Mindy definitely stood out to me. I just, the veterinary, her whole thing was, like, hilarious. I don't remember certain, I'm trying to remember if there's anything that stood out, but I just feel like her, I don't know, oh, okay, I now remember, like, when they, when the two, when Seth Rogen and Bill Hader's character were trying not to be racist. They're like, does he look like you? And then she gave up with, he is not, he is not an African Jew or something like that. Like, that was yeah. hilarious. Yes. Um, like, he's like you. It's like, oh, so, so he's Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and also I do have to say, I like when Becca, the whole entire time I was thinking, this looks just like Riley Coe. She's, um, yeah, yeah. Elvis, yeah, she's she's um you know Elvis's granddaughter, but I feel like Riley does very niche movies. She's definitely in a lot more artsy movies, um and whatnot. But yeah, all I could think of is like she looks just like Riley Coe. That's just what what I, what I was thinking when I was watching it. But Mindy definitely stood out. Um, yeah, she it was hilarious. Yeah. Also, uh, I didn't shout out uh, Carla Gallo as. She's in this movie as period blood girl. That's actually her name. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Poor she, girl. She is the real villain of this movie. I'm just going to say that right now. Well, okay. Yeah. By and she's way. another one who's who's uh, purely entrenched in this Apatow universe. She was in, uh, she was in Forgetting Sarah Marshall. She had a long arc in Californication. I love you, man. She's, she's been in a lot of the, these wow. comedy films. She was in Get Him to the Greek. So she's been around too. So there's a lot of like, uh, a lot of key players in this movie that just show up and are, are really funny for, I guess, longer than for there's like a scene or two. Right. Speaking of which, Dave, like the guy who was the host of the party, you know, who got Kevin Corrigan with them. He looked so familiar. That's yeah, Kevin Corrigan. He's been in so many things. Um, he was in Goodfellas say, a year prior. Did a couple of Scorsese because he was he was in The Departed. He was DiCaprio's cousin. Wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Also, in, so he, he also does some of these Apatow movies. He was in Pineapple Express. Wow. He was in True Romance, too. So, well, well traveled, uh, well traveled yeah. that guy. I love that we're talking about like Judd Apatow and like Seth Rogen stuff because I just re remembered another movie that I thought was hilarious. That I thought was hilarious but it was really stupid i don't even remember if it was judd apatow but i'm quite sure seth rogan was in it but it was one of those like danny mcbride comedy ones um your highness oh with uh natalie portman yes i don't okay. remember i don't know if that was a judd apatow one or not i don't believe I so but it had all those had all those people and i think james franco was in that one too yeah yeah he was okay so we, we talked about apatow he produced this movie this was directed by Greg Matola, who followed this up with Adventureland, which is also a movie I love, which I want to cover at some point with Kristen Stewart and Jesse Eisenberg and Ryan Reynolds. 
I was going, I'm going to Bridget. I don't know if you've seen this movie before, but he also directed a movie called clear history. Have you seen this? No, I have not. No. Okay. Well, I'm going to sell you on it then. Okay. This is with Larry David and John Hamm. Chris, I don't think you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, right? <laughs> I've watched a little bit of it, but it's very surface level that I'm not like an expert or anything. Okay. <laughs> it's it's so funny once you get into it. It's the topical humor. So it's just, yeah. Bridget, this is basically like an hour and 45 minute episode of Curb. It's oh so, my God. <laughs> I recommend it. So same director is super bad. Um, John Hamm and Larry David play two guys who go into business together. John Hamm's character basically comes up with the next Google and okay. Larry David is skeptical and says, I want out of the company at the beginning of the movie. Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. And John Hamm's character obviously becomes a, a billionaire many times over. And Larry David has kind of dedicated his life to destroying this guy. <laughs> and a lot of people, I think Maya Rudolph's in this, uh, Bill Hader and Michael Keaton are in this as a pair of assassins. It, nice. Very funny movie. So I recommend that. Uh, those are some of the things Greg Matola, the director of this, has also done. Okay. Sounds On good. that note, uh, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll start talking about our favorite scenes. We are back. Favorite scenes. So the first one I have written down here is the cooking class. And this is just, you, you kind of see all the characters in this one. I really like uh, Seth's dialogue with this home ec teacher, where he's just like, we all know home ec is a joke. No offense. It's just that everyone takes this class to get an A, and it's bullshit. No offense. I'm not putting down your profession, but am I ever going to make tiramisu? What am I ever going to be? What am I going to be a chef? It's like <laughs> three weeks left in school. Give me a fucking break. I don't mean to curse. <laughs> That sounded like a lot of improv there. It was really funny. And he gets paired up with Jules. And it's really funny when he's like simulating, like jerking off behind your back. <laughs> we see Fogel. I think this is the first time we see Fogel in the movie. He comes in and he's talking about how he's walking behind the girl in, in the hallways. And she turns around. And he's like, uh, it's 1033. I, I love the teacher t- class. It's like, Fogel. Hi. <laughs> he just he runs off. Really funny scene. I, I enjoyed this one a lot. Bridget, what'd you think of that scene? Loved it. It was hilarious. And you know, it just reminded me of like something a high schooler would say. I guess as somebody who teaches high schoolers, like, <laughs> what am I ever gonna do this with my life? Make tiramisu. You know? <laughs> yeah. Graduating two weeks. Like <laughs> I was just like, yes, yes, I love that. <laughs> Chris, what'd you think of this? Oh my goodness. So what I thought is like, I was just like, oh my God, of course, like they're like Maroki is like kind of like just there. He's like the passive Asian, you know, like of course there of course. was a passive a- Asian. When he's playing the cat. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm just like, oh my goodness. And but I yeah, that scene was great especially like when emma stone like turned back and he just had to and it was crazy because another thing i could think of is like you know this is the first time we see emma stone in the movie and Mm -hmm. i all i could think of was like this is why she became a star like she just has this magnetism to her she's charming she's likable like she's like the kind of girl that like like all guys like want to be friends with because she's just like chill and whatnot and like she can hang with like the craziest nuttiest wildest bros and whatnot and you know that's why like that's like that's like a singular charm for emma stone i think is that like she's got she had that quality she has that quality and like you saw it like on full display on that scene it's like yes like this is why she had her upswing and she is where she is now. (laughs) And I think the first thing Seth says to her is like, Hey, your partner didn't show up. And she goes, that's kind of personal. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. It was just like, she, she's here to play too. Really, really good. Loved her in the scene. And the movie. Uh, Bridget, what's the scene you liked? Um, (laughs) so the first one I wrote down was the flashback of the obsession with drawing dicks and everything. (laughs) Yeah, not talk about this. (laughs) Right? Um, And they have to call in a priest for him and that he thinks I'm possessed by some dick devil. (laughs) You know how many foods are shaped like dicks? The best kind. (laughs) Yeah, and there's just there's 
dicks. There's a smiley face dick. There's a dick on George Washington. There's no pubes. There's there's uh there's some that are written in pencil. Some are painted. There's like a, an army brigade coming after this one dick. There's just <laughs> there's so many funny pictures of dicks. One of the things I I read in the production was that the actor who was playing young Becca couldn't hold the picture of dicks for, I, I guess, obvious reasons. So the picture she's looking at in the movie is just like a blank piece of paper. And then it's, <laughs> it's, it's made out to be like, she, she saw a picture of all these dicks that Seth's drawing. Uh, just, yeah, that's really funny scene. Possibly right. the signature scene in the movie. Right. Might, yes. Might be one that people think about, but there's a lot of scenes like that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Chris, what's the scene you like? God, so I feel like this is this feels kind of trivial, but my favorite scene slash part of the whole movie, like I'll never forget, like it's the only scene like I really remember from having watched it so long ago, because I feel like it really stuck with me when I first watched it as a teenager, and I was like, this is what teenagers do. But when Jonah Hill was like, she wants my dick all over her mouth, I just... <laughs> That part, like, is the funniest part of the movie to me because I just, like I said, it has, it. I found it relatable when I watch it because I'm just like, yep, it seems like, like, you know, this is the time in my life when I was a freshman in high school. I'm like, I feel like this is teenager, teenager dumb. Like, that, like, that was kind of the, like, hit me moment. And I feel like that's why it stuck with me so long. But that part of the, where he just says that line, that's my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> And that was, I think, right after the scene where um, she, uh, Jules gives him the money for the alcohol. Yes. Like, you scratch your, you scratch your back. I'll scratch mine. Yeah. And he says, you know, funny thing about my back is it's located on my cock. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and She's like, what? I was in a packed theater seeing this, and it was just, oh my God. like my stomach. Yeah, like I said, my stomach hurt. That was one of like, like mm -hmm. did he really just fucking say that? <laughs> like, yeah. Just yeah, so many great one-liners in this movie. Uh, the next one I have written down here, I just have as McLovin. And this is where right. he, sh yeah. he shows Seth and Evan the fake ID. And I yeah. just love, I love Jonah Hill in this scene. He's just genuinely angry. It's like, what the fuck was it between that or Muhammad? <laughs> <laughs> and, it, you know, Michael Sarah is like, what, what are you trying to be an R&B R &B singer? Yes. <laughs> wrote this down too. Yes. <laughs> He's like, one name, one name. What are you, Seal? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you're here's another kid with a fake ID or here's McLovin, 25 year old Hawaiian organ donor. <laughs> and right after this, it, uh, Jonah Hill's Seth's car gets towed because he parked in the staff parking lot. And I love McLovin. And he's like, why would you park in the staff parking lot? And he's just mumbling. He's like, shut up, Fogel. He's like, cause you're not staff. <laughs> he's like, I know Fogel. <laughs> he's, this is, you know, another one that could be, there's so many scenes that, Maybe mm -hmm. you haven't seen the movie in 20 years, but you automatically come to and the dick drawings or just the whole McLovin scene. You know, there were T-shirts with McLovin. There's actual flags that you can buy on eBay or probably Amazon with McLovin's ID as the flag. So just so many like a current meme. relevant things. Yeah. It's like a current meme, right? You still see him like circulate on the internet a lot, like yep. in 2022. Yep. It's hilarious. <laughs> just to like add to like McLovin, just McLovin I think the funny like another like scene now thinking about it in hindsight is funny is like when they were talking about the vest like they were like you look like a pedophile with the vest and like and then later yeah. it's like I should have kept the vest and it's just crazy to me <laughs> because it made me think now like in this day and age I think you could totally get away with it because I feel like a like gen like I feel like dressing like ugly ugly is like totally acceptable now and people like don't right care, you know yeah so i feel like it's definitely like it's dated what, it, in. what we thought it was kind of dated the was like gonna, that yeah, yeah it was dated like at that. the time but like now right. it's back like props to gen z for like like bringing all this back like it's cool to dress like ug like ugly or whatever <laughs> <laughs> well he says that he was he was wearing the vest because it makes me look older like he was, <laughs> he was, he was <laughs> He was trying to look older for when he met up with Mindy to get the, the alcohol later. Yeah. Um, another one I have written down here, the uh, the daydreaming by Seth when he's about to go into the store himself because he's just, he has no confidence in yeah. the McLovin ID. And we just see all these different scenarios and he's buying the liquor and 
he's like, how old are you? 22. And the cashier's like, you certainly are. $80. And he just he pulls out an $80 bill. <laughs> yeah. Where'd that come from? And then uh, he high fives the cashier. And then the old lady he sees, and he's, she's like, he goes to her. He's like, enjoy your remaining years. Goes, I will enjoy fucking jewels. I right. will. I will. And then the security guard cuts his throat. He's like, don't do it, kid. It's like, I never had a choice. And then we just cut. We just cut to like Seth defeated, just walking out of the liquor store. And he's like, I would have done it, but there was a security breach. So this was just kind of like high school kids just bantering with each other. I, I love, I love that scene. Bridget, any thoughts on that one? Oh yeah, that was great. That was awesome. Um, and you know, from there, not too long afterwards, just the whole Bill Hader Rogan opening scene. You know, like <laughs> yeah, but we'll go buy an alcohol. Yeah. And um, I, you guys said it earlier too with Mindy. The I have a goddamn virginity exam tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like sounds like someone has an exam. <laughs> 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 yeah. And uh, we we get like Fogel giving his name to the cops, like what's your name? And he's like, McLovin. Like, what's your first name? He's like, don't worry about it. It's don't like, worry. But we're the police. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, how old are you, McLovin? He's like, old enough. <laughs> old enough to what? He's like, to party. <laughs> so good. I like. He comes in a liquor store and he drops the beer on the floor. And we see just this disgruntled employee is like, sir, did you do this? And McLovin is just like, no, you should really clean this up before someone someone hurts themselves. And this guy's Love like, it. fuck my life. <laughs> <laughs> and we see him when the robbery starts. He's just he's in the back just drinking a beer. <laughs> yeah. and it's that guy was at the party later, the party later, too. Later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. I, I was know, like, what? It's that guy. guy. <laughs> yep. Um. Another one I have written down here, uh, McLovin and the cops take the call to the bar. And this is where the, the old guy who calls him, sees him on the bus later in the film and calls him McMuffin. But he, <laughs> he, allegedly this, this old guy was pissing at the bar and he, he runs around, he attacks, McLo- he attacks McLovin, gets past these cops, but McLovin kind of stops him by just like having himself be the guy that this old man trips over. And that's when they have the beer at the bar. He's like, uh, I think Bill Hader's like, I'm buying you a beer, McLovin. And it's like, you're just, and I think Seth Rogen's like, McLovin in the fucking house. And just them talk, just their conversation. We already talked about it, how Hader's talking about his future wife. And he's like, yeah, I found out she was an actual whore. <laughs> just great scene here. Um, Chris, any thoughts on that one? Let me see. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, that one was funny and it's funny because it like it's making me also kind of think of like the next like funny scene that they had Mm -hmm. and that was when they walked in on McLovin McLovin (laughs) like having sex and they were like they were just like did we just cock block McLovin (laughs) we should be guiding his cock cock not blocking it Like, I just thought that one was hilarious. But I did think that one bar scene was also, like, hilarious. Especially because, like, <laughs> because McLovin, all he had to do was be there. And then he, and then, like, the dude, like, just tripped. All yeah. <laughs> so he looked like a hero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, it was a hilarious scene. I you could tell the dialogue between Rogan, Plass, and Hater there. It was none of that was scripted at all. They're just they're just right. kind of like riffing there. Yes. Um, the last two I have written down here are kind of towards the end of the movie. I've got the sleepover where we get the boop <laughs> between yeah. Evan and Seth, and then the end scene at the mall, which was like a, a nice button to this movie. Yeah. But yeah. before we go to the end, did either of you have anything you wanted to cite? Um, so back at the party with Michael Sarah when he swings the drink and he's like, two respecting women. <laughs> and, and i was like okay that's you know here at this bro culture party and whatnot yeah. you know michael Sarah, you know he's still trying to do it right he's still and you know when he's like in the bed with her and he's like just be careful it's a meaningful sweater it's vintage from the vintage <laughs> market <laughs> that was really nice that was really like i guess a, culturally relevant because when you think of some of these like teen comedies mm-hmm. from like the 80s like 70s i think of animal house which is really mm-hmm. bad uh, Revenge of the Nerds, which is which was like, you know, they're not emphasizing like consent for, the, right. for these type of things. Where this is right. like a really nice scene 
where you see like Michael Sarah be act very respectfully towards Becca. Yes. Which, not necessarily something we saw a lot in in movies of of this genre before. So I thought I thought that was a good touch <laughs> for her. And I think that's you know we talked about it earlier the Apatow factor. I think that he kind of right. is, is on top of these these little details here. Um. All right. So the sleepover we get this is after the party, yes. and at this point Seth and Evan had had this big fight and they make up. Um. And Seth confesses that. Um, the big thing is that Fogel and Evan are going to Dartmouth together. They're rooming together and they don't, they haven't told Seth yet, but he confesses that he saw, um, he saw their mail and he knew he's known for weeks and he's like, we should say we love each other more often. And this is a really, really nice scene between these two. And it ends with, uh, it's like, I want the world to know that I love my best friend, Evan. And he gives him like the boop and, you know, there's subtle examples of these characters genuinely have affection for one another. This is, on the nose this is they they really do care about each other Bridget, what'd you think of that scene yeah you know it really showed like their intimacy as as friends you know like finally after like kind of this conflict the whole movie here we see you know the friendship and the love that they have for each other um you know before before the end before you know they both know what's about to happen they're about to go their separate ways but it's like that last it's kind of like a boyhood thing you know you're sleeping over my house right yeah. but you know it's it's done in a very endearing way i think so i agree Sorry. with bridget and yeah i totally agree with bridget and it's funny because i'm just thinking like man like this movie like it touches on things that you don't like especially during that time you don't see very often and now i'm thinking like damn it was kind of like ahead of its time in some way yeah. like the michael sayer saying cheers to respecting women and then you yes. see like <laughs> more like affection between like especially like like affection between like these two like guys and you know mm -hmm. like hugging each other in bed and saying i love you and i'm just like yeah like you don't see that often and like even now like it's becoming more acceptable to like it, like that's becoming like more normalized yeah stuff like that but like like to see it how it was in a movie like this and like dang like it really did something that not many movies did at that time and it's kind of nice that you know years has passed and this has become like more normalized and whatnot and like it's couldn't, less taboo i guess <laughs> sure yeah couldn't agree more uh, the end scene at the mall. This was just a nice button to the movie. You know, left let you left the theater feeling good about these characters and where they were headed, even if we're never going to get a sequel. Although, you know, they, <laughs> they've said that there's no more story to tell. But if we could get like a Netflix show just about mm -hmm. Michaels and Slater and what they're doing, what right. they're doing now, like I would totally watch every episode of that. I, I would. <laughs> I would imagine these guys are not cops anymore. <laughs> Probably <laughs> shortly after this film. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, but the end scene at the mall, this is a really nice scene. We see Seth and Evan, they're shopping for pants. And Seth is asking, like, what do you think of these pants? And Evan's just like, yeah, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that would probably be me if I was going with one of my male friends and was asking, right. like, what, what's your opinion on the pants I'm buying? And probably if I was asking a male friend about my pants. So, so that's very relatable, like guys shopping together. <laughs> so I like that. And it ends with them running into Jules and Becca at the mall. Um, Becca's buying Jules a new comforter because she threw up on hers <laughs> and Evan is also buying a comforter and he asks her if she wants to get food later so they go off their way presumably to you know a happy ending there and then we see um, Seth is about to buy Jules uh, cover up because he gave her unfortunately and accidentally a, a black <laughs> eye at the party by, by falling into her and so they go up down the escalator and that's how the movie ends presumably with these uh, two quote unquote couples uh, about about to ha have a good summer with each other. Uh, I thought it was a very nice ending to this movie. You you laughed the whole way and you left the theater feeling good about the characters. Bridget, how'd you feel at the end of the movie? I loved it. I thought it really sealed it nicely, you know, that they had their moment, they had their last sleepover together and, you know, they'll probably still stay in touch, I hope, you know. You, you hope that they'll see each other down the line, but they, they finally accepted, they're going to grow up. You know, they're going to embrace maybe a relationship with the women. Maybe it won't be as scary as, you know, they think. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they they have some growth finally. So it's, it was it was nice. I thought it was a sweet ending. Great ending. I, I thought so too. Chris, what did you think of the ending? I agree with Bridget. 
that it was just a great ending. What I loved about it was it's just like, like you said, Bridget, it's like, okay, everyone's like finally grown up. Like yeah. just one night can like change your whole perspective. And they're just like, yeah, it was crazy. Like, and like how timing divine intervention happened and they're meant, it shows that they're meant to, you know, like be with each other and like just see what happens. And like, there's nothing weird. It's like, yeah, like, I think it's just a teenage thing where you try so hard to like impress people and you know you just grow out of it and you know you just don't care as much and so it was like yes finally they've grown up they they don't yes. have to like try so hard right <laughs> all right so we're all we're all in sync there that we, we love the ending ending of this movie in addition to loving the movie in general yes. great film it's a great job on the scenes everybody we are going to move on to according to the internet so usually I like to start these with the, the casting almost. There's only two notable ones here. And I would imagine, you know, in the Apatow universe of films here, they usually a lot of these guys have been in other films before mm -hmm. in, in that universe. So there wasn't really like a lot of a lot of decision with the casting. It seems like most of these were kind of set in stone. They had somebody in mind when they were writing the script. But I have two here. You could I'll just fire them off here. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence was considered for the role of Jules. Mm -hmm. Here's here's a wild one. Uh, Shia LaBeouf was considered for the role of Seth. So these are the two, you know, we call this according to the internet. This might be total bullshit, but this is something I saw online. Uh, you know, I, I, I think Jennifer Lawrence, Emma Stone there, you know, 2007, you have six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. It could have went either way, although I wouldn't have, replace Emma Stone in this. I thought she was really good, but Jennifer Lawrence, obviously great actress. I uh, love her. She might have done a different, but great job too. Yeah. Shia LaBeouf, that's one I have, tr I have trouble wrapping oh my, my head around. It just, well, it's, 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 it's funny fork in the road moment because he does Transformers that year and his right. career kind of goes yeah. in a different trajectory. Mm -hmm. If he had done super bad, maybe I don't know what would have happened for Coming everybody. from his goofy Disney kid past, I mean, yeah. maybe he could have kind of segued into the more teen comedy if he really wanted to. Right. But it I fits. think you're right that he just, he chose the path that he did with like Transformers and then some of his other projects down the line. So back then, it maybe, it maybe could have yeah. worked. Yeah. Chris, any thoughts on either of us? That's interesting. So yeah, Jennifer Lawrence, I feel like she could have, been yeah. like a great second option if like Emma Stone wasn't available so I definitely could have seen Jennifer Lawrence and also Jennifer Lawrence and Emma Stone from my understanding are actually like friends in real life last I read, yeah. which was like years okay. ago like 2017 2016 when you know they were both kind of like at career peaks and let's see Shia LaBeouf now thinking about it I think think I could have seen him just because like with how his whole trajectory has happened and like he's yeah. kind of become a meme of himself like he had <laughs> like the cannibal Shia LaBeouf thing I don't remember but he's because he became like a meme like I feel like I could have I think he could have done okay as the as Seth but I mean I feel like like Jonah Hill was just like this was his starring vehicle just because yeah. like you know Shia LaBeouf had holes and then he had Transformers like you know it's time for someone else to like shine so I think it worked well like so Shia LaBeouf I could have seen it but I, I really think Jonah Hill really just embodied this whole role well and I'm just like I just love how his career has like like just progressed from all sure. that he really has expanded like his artistry and himself as a person because he's he's not just a one trick pony like he's done multiple other things yeah <laughs> yeah so i think we're, we all agree we'd keep the cast as it was but it is oh yeah it is fun to think about these these what if scenarios in the right. multiverse right. of comedy here <laughs> uh bridgette do you have anything from the internet so the dance moves in the opening credits came from an hour of Michael Sarah just improvising them on set, which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and um, I read that Justin Lawn had been a part of the movie, but he ended up on the cutting room floor. Okay. I'm going to piggyback off you. Uh-huh. Justin Long, Kristen Wiig, Adam Scott, really? and Ken Jeong really? all had cameos in this movie that were cut. No way. Yeah. Wow. What a waste of talent. <laughs> I, I mean, I, this was before Step Brothers, so I, I guess Adam yeah. Scott really 
I only had remembered him from a small arc on Six Feet Under right. before that. Right. So it wasn't like, you know, they, they weren't cutting Daniel Day-Lewis out of their film at that, at that point. Right. So, yeah, and Ken yeah, Jeong. They hadn't really that, found themselves as comedians, any of them, I guess, yeah. yet. So at the time, I'm sure it didn't seem to us who have seen all of those people do amazing things, you know, right. like it would be fun to see them pop up in something like this. And I even went, I went to YouTube to see if there was any footage. Yeah. Like, you know, if you look up Eric Stoltz and back to the future, you can find like basically like a whole 40 minutes of footage as him and with him as Marty McFly, but there's no, uh, Kristen Wiig, super bad footage. Just no, no respect from YouTube. Right. right? Yeah. Scott is in severance, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Perfect. I'm just trying to like remember, yeah. like, link the face with the name because Adam yeah. I was like that name is familiar he's the guy yep. right okay awesome yep. mm-hmm. uh, let's let's do a little impromptu trivia how many times do you think the word fuck was used in this movie oh my god <laughs> do we get a get multiple choice or is this just a random just give me a number we'll, we'll go the win- <laughs> whoever gets closer is the winner so between Bridget. 70 to 80 70 to 80 okay all right I guess I'll I'll go with um 95 you both undershot uh, oh but God. Bridget was closer. 176. Oh, 176 man. fucks. In this I movie. almost said 100. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> so Bridget's the winner on The Price is Right. <laughs> Good job, Bridget. Good job. <laughs> um, I had two more. We did t- one of mine was that we uh, Christopher Mintz Plass's mom had to be on the set yeah. for the sex scene because he was only 17. Yeah. Uh, I just got one more here. And uh, the man who throws the baseball bat at Seth. Uh, Jonah Hill. That's actually Mark Rogan, the the brother of Seth Rogan, who just showed up for for that one part in the movie. So Seth Rogan's brother nice. is the guy who throws the bat. The nice throw with the bat. He, he yeah, really, he nailed him there. All right, so on to trivia. Uh, Bridget, you said you messaged me offline. You said uh, you had a question. Would you like me to go first, or would you like to go first? Um, you can you can go ahead. All right. Okay, so we talked about we've talked about at length Jonah Hill and the great career he's had and how he's done so many different things, so many different types of movies. He's also worked with a lot of prestigious directors. I'm going to give you a list here. Uh, Chris, you can take first guess. Bridget, you can go second. I'm going to give you a list of directors here. Jonah Hill has been in a movie for all of these directors except for one. So one of these people he has not worked with. So here's the list. All but one. Quentin Tarantino. Martin Scorsese. Steven Spielberg, Gus Van Sant, Adam McKay, or the Coen brothers? Which of these has he not been in a film directed by? I'm going to go with Steven Spielberg. Chris is going to go Spielberg. Okay. Bridget? What was the first one? Tarantino. He was the first Um... I feel like I'm wrong, but I'm going to go with that. <laughs> you go with Tarantino. Chris, you got it. It was uh, never been in a Spielberg. Brigitte, he had a cameo in Django Unchained. A cameo. Okay. The, All the, right. the, 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 the clan <laughs> scene. <laughs> yeah, the, the holes in the masks. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, just for the listeners, uh, he was in Wolf of Wall Street. That was He was nominated for an Oscar for that Scorsese film. Uh, don't worry, he won't get far on foot with uh, Joaquin Phoenix, the Gus Van Sant joint. Don't Look Up, we talked about earlier. That's Adam McKay. And then Hail Caesar, the, the Coen Brothers movie. So he's done all of those. Bridget, you can get, you can get me back now. <laughs> all right, guys. So, um, so who was an extra in the background of the first party scene in Superbad? Was it A, Paul Rudd, B, Danny McBride, or C, Jason Siegel? I, I know the answer to this, so Chris, I'll defer to Chris. Danny McBride. Yeah. You're right, though. McBride. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. I'm Good sure you job. came across it in your trivia. I gotta, I gotta step it up next time. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that was good. good. Good question. I should have mentioned it earlier. So, good question there. All right. I Awards didn't see him time. though. Did you? What's Did you that? guys see him? Did you guys see him? In uh, when I googled it, I saw a still image, but I okay. Couldn't catch it in the movie, but I, yeah, I, I didn't yeah. catch it in the movie. I didn't yeah. see it, but I just assumed because Danny McBride right. is always a yeah. collaborator with that. Right. Yeah, right. All right, awards time. So we do a sixth man and an MVP of the movie. Uh, just for anyone 
listening who's like, what the hell is a six man? That's in a basketball team. The six man is the first person who comes off the bench. So not the LeBron James or the Kevin Durant of the team or the Kobe, whatever your basketball knowledge is. I'll just throw out a bunch of players there. <laughs> so somebody who comes off Hold the bench. My head. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, it's fine. Just for when I'm with uh, non-sports fans, it's totally cool. Um, so this is someone who was in the movie for a little bit and really like had an impact on the film. So talking about this, when we, I think we decided to do this movie like a few weeks ago and immediately I was like, Bill Hader, six man. But then I, I, I watched the movie again and I just, I really had an appreciation for Joe Latrulio as Francis. And I just, I just thought he was, he was so funny. If you did like a, where is he now? Mm -hmm. And if you, if you said to me, he's somebody who's a multimillionaire now uh, investing in NFTs, or <laughs> he has 20 bodies buried in his backyard. I wouldn't flinch at either of those scenarios. I'd just be like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Fucking Francis. Like, <laughs> he's just, he's so funny in the car, when he's in the car with them and he's like, who's going to give it to her? You are my man. And he goes for the <laughs> high five and they, they just look at him and he just every line he says, like, you guys on my space. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I love I love him in this movie. So I went with uh, Joe Latrulio as Francis as my sixth man of the movie. Bridget, where'd you go? I loved him. I think I am going to go with Bill Hader. Sure. Um, and just knowing his growth, I know you like Barry like I do. Yeah. Um, and like seeing where he has come and whatnot. And then, you know, revisiting kind of his origins with, you know, just his dumb comedy like this. Uh, I mean, it was it was just fun to see him like that again. Like, you know, it, it just it made me happy. So I'm going to go with him. That'll be a good Instagram poll then. <laughs> Chris, which way did you go with this one? Yeah. So uh, let me see. I'm trying to think. So Six Man is like kind of like the underrated like. Can't be. You, you can't give it to Sarah Hill uh, Stone or uh, Plass, the four big stars in the movie. Gotcha. Let me see. Um Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh god so if i would go with bridget but the a part of me would kind of go with period girl because i feel like that was just so <laughs> absurd that like yeah. i'm just like i just feel like that's just so absurd and unreal that it is like <laughs> kind of funny like especially like I, like I was just like, wait, what? So I think period girl might. There you go. Sure. <laughs> and this was actually another thing I read on the internet that this was something. This was based on a guy that Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg knew when they were writing the script. That's how it made. Probably not when they were thirteen and started writing the script. They didn't know about this, but this was something that the, they witnessed later in life. So they oh they put gosh. it into the movie. Oh my so, god. So that poor guy's out there somewhere who got perioded on his leg. <laughs> oh my god! Like they made They're a movie. poor girl too, though. It's like you're known as period girl for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll have a good uh, Instagram poll for that one. MVP of the movie for me, this was a two horse race between Sarah and Hill, and ultimately I went with Michael Sarah. I think this is kind of the pinnacle of his career. I think this is the biggest movie that he's made. Some might argue Scott Pilgrim, but I, I would say I like that movie just as much, but this was kind of the one that like made him arrive. And when I think of Jonah Hill, I think he was arguably funnier in 21 Jump Street. He was, I think he was definitely funnier in Wolf of Wall Street when he's talking about how he, how he married his cousin and just a lot of those lines seemed improvised too. Um, so not to knock his performance in this, but just strictly for awards purposes. And I, I ultimately have to pick one. So I want Michael Sarah in this movie as, as the MVP. I, I just thought he was fun. I thought, I don't think you can go wrong with either Jonah Hill or Seth, or Seth Rogen, Jonah Hill or Michael Sarah. But I ultimately want Michael Sarah because I think this is, when you think of the career of Michael Sarah, you think of super bad. When you think of the career of Jonah Hill, you probably think of super bad, but amongst like four or five other things. So that's, that's my reasoning for going Sarah here. Bridget, how about you? So, could this include? It's just between the two of them, or who no, else could, being yeah, whoever you want. Okay, um, I do like Michael Sarah a lot. I guess I'm gonna pick Emma Stone. 
Okay. Just because, you know, we, we did discuss her a lot and her amazing career. And um, I was just blown away with how good she was back then. I did not remember her being that strong as she was back then. So, you know, she kind of won me over with that. Perfect. Great pick. Chris? I'm going to be cliche and go with Hill just because, yeah. you know, when I watched this, I was just like, this was the first big thing I saw Jonah Hill in. And, you know, it made me think of, what he's done with his career and I just I just feel like um creatively and artistically what he's done throughout the years um it's incredible and it would have not happened without this starring vehicle for him I really feel like this was a breakout for him so I would have to go with uh, Jonah cool cool so we got some good polls for for the gram coming up uh, shortly after I post the show great job uh, Bridget, what is something good you watched this week? Um, so of course the season, she's the finale of Better Call Saul last series. night. I haven't watched series. Those spoilers, yeah. Chris, but I we're not going to say anything because Chris has to catch up. That's fine. Yeah. Um, a lot of emotion. Catch- yeah. I'm just going to say that. Wait, Certainly. what? A lot of emotions. I'm just going to say that. Okay. Certainly. You're going to love, you're going to love everything, Chris. You're going to love this new season. And I'm, I have to mention, never have I ever Because I know you've been watching it too, Chris. And it's just such a fun teen comedy show on Netflix that Mindy Kaling did. And she's back for season two. And um, it's it's just a lot of fun. Okay. It's called Never Have I Ever? I I don't even know what this is. Yeah. Oh, it's season. It's on season three now. Oh, really? Right. I'm sorry. Season three. Yeah. Okay. Let me talk about it, Chris. I know you've been um, pumping it up too online. Yeah. I just finished episode four and I'm going to gradually make it. That's where I am. So, yes. Bridgette, what's the what's the premise of this the show? Um, so it follows a young Indian teen girl, and um, you know, you you kind of have some of the cliches, um, high school trope cliches and whatnot. But you know, they they're breaking a lot of that. They're bringing representation. She's got like the Asian best friend and um, black best friend, and it's just like she doesn't want to be a typical Indian girl though. Okay. She wants she wants to be having sex. She wants to be she doesn't even like a lot of her Indian culture, you know, or she doesn't follow a lot of the religious practices and whatnot. But, you know, her her mom and her aunt, you know, they're they're very strong um, actresses and whatnot. And so it's it's I don't know, it has a good wholesomeness to it, but okay. it's also just like it's it's really funny. OK, yeah, cool. Might have, yeah. To, might have to jump on this three seasons already. Yeah, yep, it's, a, it's it. a quick one to burn through. They're like 30 minute episodes. Okay. Yes. Um, and so it's light and fun. I'll blame, I'll take this opportunity to shit on Netflix again, just for their lack of advertising. And this is why I've, I've never yeah. heard of the show. Yeah. <laughs> Mindy Kaling, you can't go wrong with Mindy Kaling either. No, so certainly she, not. She created all of it. So, Chris, what's something good you watched this week? So, something good I watched this week. So, it's only Tuesday. So, it's still early in the week. <laughs> But I am watching the new season of Never Have I Ever with Bridget. I just love the wholesomeness of the show. It's yeah. very light, very breezy, you know. I mean, especially because, like, I feel like like life is just crazy enough. Well, especially in 2022, I just think it's been. But, like, it's just light and breezy and wholesome. I just love, 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 love the representation of this yes. show. It really showcases you know, Indian culture, brown Asian culture, like all, like uh, lots of great representation. You've got like, like an Asian character, like or East Asian character. You've got a black character. You've got a Jewish character. You've got like someone who's like half a, like there's incredible yeah. representation on this show and it really just breaks. And like- they're all funny and strong. Like they're all good actors. Like they, and they, they build them up really well to their characters. You know, they're not just like side characters, right? Like they all kind of have something that they bring to the show too, which I love. Truly, truly. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like, yeah, they're all just very, like what I love about it is how you're right, Bridget. Like they're very, their their own characters and like none no one feels really sidelined or at least yeah. I think so. But I can talk about what I watched last week, I guess. So I will sure. say I finally binged Blackbird and the Bear. You know, nice. so love early, the bear. Two bangers. I, yeah, I watched Blackbird and the Bear. Both were great. Yeah. 
the bears are the bears a fast one because the episodes are like 25 30 yeah. minutes yeah 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 Oh Eight yeah, it, it is. Yeah. I like I finished that like in two days because I got hooked. I'm just like and yeah. like and I think I think I mentioned this, but it really felt like I'm cut jobs. <laughs> it gets stressful. Yeah, yeah it some, does. Yeah, You're in that kitchen. Seven. Episode six or seven. It was where... seven. And it's like mm. crazy. One because... take. Yeah. One take. Yeah, one take because like it made me think like, okay, so I've had a food service job before, but my first food service job ever was Chipotle. So I feel like it's something different, but that was stressful. But like, yeah, it like it makes me feel like it gave me like this new appreciation for like food workers and food service workers, especially like in a local like mom and pop shop. Like I like it makes me right. Is it really that accurate, like how stressful it is, like to work in somewhere like that? Like, but yeah, I like have a new like appreciation for like that just from watching the bear. But yeah, totally. <laughs> so that's yeah. what I watched this past week. <laughs> and I, I was a waiter for a decade, so I yeah, know, I definitely, I remember like, you saying that? Things. Yeah, I definitely pick up on a lot of it. Like that's the way people in a kitchen yeah. staff talk to each other. It, yeah, just... I was a hostess, and I dealt with them all behind me and their potty mouths. Those kitchen yep. staff. So like, yeah, uh-huh. it's it's not for the faint of heart. No, you, know? it, you can definitely tell they talk to people in the restaurant industry to get like yeah, you know, definitely feels super authentic. I. I enjoyed I enjoyed that show a lot, and I can't wait. It got picked up for a second season, so Yay. excited for that as well. Me too. All right, so I'll go movie TV. Uh, last week I got to see Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. This is the new A twenty four. I guess you can call it a comedy horror film, and it's it's about a bunch of just a bunch of rich spoiled kids who are at one of their family, one of their friends' parents' mansion's house. The friend is Pete Davidson. And they play this game called Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. It's essentially like a game of Clue. And, you know, usually this is fun, but um, for whatever reason, I won't, I won't get into spoiler territory, but for whatever reason, people start dying in this party. And it's got kind of some familiar names and then like some up and coming, up and coming actors. Uh, Rachel Sennett, who was in a movie, an indie film called Shiva Baby, which I loved. It was so funny. I recommend both of you seeing it. But she's like, I, apparently really i'm gonna sound like a 90 year old man at this point but apparently she's really popular on tiktok okay. <laughs> she's, she's really popular on the tiktok <laughs> <laughs> um but she's she's getting she's so funny i i love her she's so great she was great in this uh maria bakalova who was in the last borat movie uh, i guess she was playing his niece oh, yeah oh uh, she was so funny yeah she and she's good in this too uh pete davidson was in this lee pace from, I think he was in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies as the villain. I, the name is escaping me, but he, yeah. he's in this too. So, And then there's just like a lot of up-and-coming actors who you're probably going to see uh, in the future. Amanda Stenberg's in it too, right? And she was in Dear Evan Hansen, which I try to forget that I saw. Yeah, she was in <laughs> The Hunger Games and she was in The Hate You Give. Too. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You? Was she yeah. the lead character? She was the lead in the hate. Yeah. Game. Okay, I saw that in theaters and I forgot about it, and then <laughs> I don't I don't remember much about that movie, but I don't think it was bad. I just don't remember it. Right. It was one of the, it, was, it was fine. Um. Okay. Yeah. So that 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 checks out now. Okay. Cool. Glad. So I've seen her in things. I I like the hate you give better than Dear Evan Hansen though. <laughs> no. Yeah. It's a it's a good book too. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go with that. And uh, the new season of Industry started. This is uh, now on Monday nights on HBO. And mm. some people have compared this to Succession. I'm mm. not willing to go there. I think Succession is yeah. a much better show. But this is, you know, basically it's young bankers in the finance industry in London. And everyone's rich. It's basically just I don't really know if there's any likable characters in the show similar to Succession. I guess that's where you can kind of end the parallels. Um, but this this was another one because of the pandemic season one ended summer at the end of summer 2020 and now here we are 2022 i had forgotten the show i had put this in my top 10 of the year for 2020 it was it was a really good show and i almost forgot about everything about it and then once i started watching again i was like okay i remember these people and they gave like a nice like previously on at the beginning but you know two years between seasons it's it's a lot to try to hold all that retain all that information right but this but is a really I'm, good show on HBO on HBO Max. I I recommend it. 
uh, yeah, I'd recommend both those. So that kind of reminds me, like, has it was making me think, has anyone watched the new Westworld season? Because I know yeah, it was like a two I've been year. watching it. You've okay. been watching it. I yeah. like haven't kept up with it. I think it was just because I just didn't like how season three ended, but it's the same thing where it was like so long that I forgot. I know. That it came yep. up. It's a little better than last season. I don't think it's as strong as it was in the beginning of the show. Um, I know Aaron Paul's getting a lot of hate. I don't think he's horrible in it. Like, I think he's pretty okay. good in it. Okay. Um, Aaron Paul can do no wrong. Yeah, he can do no wrong. Like, he, they, they give him some interesting stuff in this season later on. If you if you hang tight, like, the last few episodes of it are pretty strong with him. Okay, so. I'll have to get to it. But don't worry, all of you, Better Call Saul is on my list. I really yes. think you can find <laughs> it on iTunes and just watch it. I'm going to give yeah. it drop money just to watch it. Because I don't know when it's going to be on Netflix. It's going to be probably a long time but i want to keep up with the hype <laughs> <laughs> all right great great rex there uh bridgette where can we follow you at um you can follow me on instagram my name is jets j-e-t-s 85 100 excellent chris yeah so you can follow me on a couple of instagram accounts we're plugging us see okay so my it's my personal one it's it's underscore Chris, so C H R I S, period, Aragon, A R A G O N, underscore. And then I did just start a separate Instagram where I do essays, slash reviews, slash my takes on movies and television. It's called Film and TV Reviews by Chris. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it is linked to my personal page i'll put a link in the show notes sounds good sounds good but yes i but i also do random takes on that instagram page as well and i did review the new beyonce album i'm sorry i got a plug in that i'm a beyonce fan and the new album is fire (laughs) noted (laughs) and even if i didn't think so i wouldn't say so because i don't want the beehive coming for me that's okay (laughs) that that is totally fine that's totally fine (laughs) All right, and you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Letterboxd under the same handle, at DDEM2000. We have an Instagram and Twitter for this show. It's at Was It That Bad Pod. Um, we post polls, show updates, quizzes. We did the six-man MVP poll. We're going to put polls for that on, on the Instagram account in the story. So we're very active on there. Come follow us for the show updates. Uh, and if you like this movie, you'd like to talk about it with myself, Brigitte, or Chris, or many other great people, you want to talk about any other movie or show, you can join the Movie and Television Talk Facebook group. Just type that into a group search, and we are the red cover photo. We are going to be off next week, so no show one week from now. We'll be back in two weeks, and the next two movies we're going to be covering are So I Married an Axe Murderer and Face Off. <laughs> so that's what we have coming up after the week off. Either of you have any initial thoughts quick thoughts on uh, either of those films oh my god it's been so long since i've seen both of them that i would have to revisit but i love michael myers so yeah yeah very good <laughs> very good myers performance chris oh god so when it comes to halloween i've only seen the first one and then of course the 2018 one i never i didn't watch well, are you talking about halloween because virgia said michael myers other michael myers the um <laughs> Austin Powers. Mike Myers. Oh my God. <laughs> That's, God, you know, usually I edit the bloopers. But, that one, that one's staying in. But like, but um, I did realize that's a Mike Myers movie. But I will say, Face Off. I think I saw it when I was little, but I don't I was remember. So little, it was it's so long ago. Yeah, I, I watched it uh, last week to early preparation, and it's, yeah. it's still so fucking good. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Well, there you go. So yeah, looking forward to yes. both of those shows. Yes. Brigitte, Chris, thanks so much for joining me tonight. This was an awesome show. Great talking to both of you. you. It was great talking to you, too. I had such a great time. I'd love to do this again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We'll definitely make that happen. (laughs) And thank you, everybody, for listening. We will catch you all next time. Night, everybody.